in to Revolution Radio, FreedomFlix.com, 100% just their support radio, and now we return you to your host. You are listening to the drumbeat of freedom and the heartbeat of truth. You're listening to the Dr. Lima Truth Report. I'm Rena Elabo, MD. I am the medical director of the Natural Solutions Foundation. And I would like to welcome you to this edition of our show. We have quite an extraordinary guest tonight. All of our guests are knowledgeable and uh, powerful forces in their own field. But I guess tonight we'll have you spellbound and sitting on the edge of your seat. So fasten your intellectual seat belt. With me, as always, my co-host and co-trustee of the Natural Solutions Foundation, the uh, freedom-fighting attorney, Ralph Fusatola. Good evening, Ralph. <laughs> Good evening, Dr. Rima. Good evening. Um, we have some very, very bad news going on from Fukushima Daiichi. Now, the Natural Solutions Foundation has been telling people since the first day that Fukushima Daiichi occurred or was engineered that this was a cataclysm of the first water. And basically, the mainstream media and the globalist forces have done everything they could to make that truth go away. But they can't make it go away. Radiation doesn't go away. And 10, not 6, but 10 nuclear reactors out of control. You see, there's Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi, which means Fukushima number 1. And then 6 kilometers away from it is Fukushima Daini, which nobody is talking about, which has four more reactors. So it's six reactors at Fukushima Daiichi and four reactors at Fukushima Daini, and they're all in trouble. And even if they weren't in trouble, given the fact that the radiation is so high there that at least 800 workers have died, and we know that despite the gag order placed on Tokyo Hospital um, by the Japanese government because nurses and doctors felt that it was simply wrong to keep that information secret from the public. They need to know, you need to know, we need to know. Um, so we know that at least 800 workers, not one, uh, as was being said, have died from uh, radiation exposure at Fukushima, and that, of course, makes perfect sense. Um, we also know that they've been dumping hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of tons of highly, highly radioactive water, and that radioactive water is leaking up from the aquifer that Fukushima Daiichi was built on top of. In fact, here's a news item. The Japanese media on Tuesday, this is a quote, reported an all-time high radiation level in an observation well at the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant. TEPCO, which we know to be uh, institutionally dishonest as well as institutionally incompetent, TEPCO said that 1.1 million becquerels of beta ray emitting radioactive material had been detected. 1.1 million radioactive decays per second in every quart of water sampled on November 28th. This figure, this is a moment when you need your seat belt at the intellectual level. This figure is 36,000 times higher than the normal level of 30 becquerels per liter and is more than the previous record high of 910,000 becquerels per liter detected four days, I'm sorry, three days earlier. Let me say that again. 910,000 becquerels, the previous record, on November 25th. On November 28th, 1.1 million becquerels. Now, you don't have to understand what a becquerel is 
to know that more of them is more radiation. Uh, this is cataclysmic, but it doesn't stop there. Um, the, the nuclear holocaust that is Fukushima, unless we do something about it, unless we do something about it, is proceeding at an accelerating rate. And we're going to be talking about what we can do about it. That's why our guest, Ken Rola, is so, so exciting. Uh, before we get to that, I want to share with you an article that you may have seen about the West Coast being, quote, absolutely fried with nuclear radiation, specifically from Fukushima. Uh, this article, and uh, Ralph, I've sent you the links. Maybe you can send them to our good engineer, uh, Richard Kane. Absolutely. So we can put them on the chat. Okay. This uh, global research report that um, the Polar bears, kids, and walruses along the Alaska coastline are suffering from fur loss and open sores. That's radiation sickness in this case. The sea lion deaths along the California coastline uh, can be accounted for very nicely by the fact that the sea lions are radioactive. Uh, along the Pacific coast of Canada and Alaska, the population of sockeye salmon is at a historic low. People believe people who study sockeye salmon uh, populations believe that is radiation related. Uh, by the way, I was at my tango class this evening, and every Thursday um, we gather around together and we um, uh, share a little bit of food and, and conviviality after the class is over. And they passed around a beautiful ceviche of fresh tuna. I wouldn't go near it. <laughs> I wouldn't go near it. And these people, lovely people all, were sitting there enjoying the tasty radioactive seafood. Um, because salmon, uh, uh, not salmon, um, tuna swim in the deep Pacific. What do you think they're eating? They're eating radioactive smaller life forms. Um, fish are bleeding from their gills, bellies, and eyeballs along the west coast of Canada. Uh, the United States, shortly after Fukushima occurred, stopped monitoring radiation in fish that's coming to your table. If you're still eating fish, you're a fool. Um, a vast field of radioactive debris from Fukushima, approximately the size of California, has crossed the Pacific Ocean and is already colliding with the West Coast. If you think, well, I live in New Jersey, it's okay. <laughs> no. As the, the radiation uh, accumulates on the West Coast, it then moves across on wind and water, and one-third of the food in North America is grown in the Central Valley, which has already exceeded uh, evacuation, previous evacuation standards for radiation. The Department of Environmental, the EPA of California, um, simply suspended those standards. Experts have found very high levels of cesium-137 in the plankton, living in the waters of the Pacific Ocean between Hawaii and the West Coast. 15 out of 15 bluefin tuna were contaminated with radiation from Fukushima in one test. Um, on and on and on and on we go. So the question is, what can we do about it? Well, I will give you a hint. Creating an ice curtain in the ground is not the answer. That is stupid beyond stupid. The half-life of uranium is four and a half billion years. Are you going to keep an ice curtain going for a hundred million years, let's say, or a million years? or 100,000 years, or 400 years? Of course not. It's idiocy, pure and simple idiocy. So what can we do about it? Now, let me tell you uh, a little bit about our guest after I pause to get Ralph's comment. My, my, Dr. Rima. Well, I was looking at the article that you mentioned, 
28 Reasons Why. Let me see. Um, 28 Reasons Why, uh, 28 Signs that the West Coast is being inundated with, is being uh, absolutely, let me see, I've got to read the actual headline here. Absolutely fried. fried with nuclear radiation from Fukushima. Not just the West Coast, of course, because uh, I've noticed uh, with our little handy Geiger counter that we keep here in the uh, in in the hills of New Jersey, that there's been about a 10% increase in the past, I would say, a year or so. Uh, so that you know, of course, you and I have both been keeping track of radiation readings uh, in the Deep South, on the East Coast, on the West Coast. Uh, yes, the trustees of the Natural Solutions Foundation have a tendency to get together on the west coast of North America. Maybe not the smartest thing to do anymore. Uh, We're not going to do that anymore. No. So, uh, so we've been monitoring it, and there's clear increase going on. But uh, uh, we need better data. And uh, that leads me to, of course, uh, talking about the new Health Freedom app. We have a, an, um, a PAD, a personal access device app for health freedom. Uh, it was uh, just posted on the Android store and on the Apple store. So if you go, for example, to your Apple store from your iPad or iPhone and put in the words health freedom, you will get back our, uh, our app. It's free. When you download it, uh, there will be a number of uh, functions there that are going to be very useful for you. And one of the ones that we're developing is a map. That's going to show radiation readings. Uh, we have to help people understand uh, where they're going, where they are, what, are, what the situation is, and uh, <clears throat> we need it immediately. The, the app has the capacity to uh, provide what are called push messages, where we can send immediate messages out to people uh, and, uh, and make it clear to them that, uh, that we have, uh, you know, that, that things are happening rapidly. That's all I can tell you. Rapidly is the proper word. And that's the new, the new social media. The new social media. So please, folks, uh, if you have your iPhone in your hand, your iPad, your Android, jump on right now. Uh, go to the store. Search Health Freedom. Join us. Hundreds of people are signing up. It's going to be a very exciting app as we develop it. And we need as many people as possible to get on it as soon as possible uh, to enable us to develop it more effectively. Never heard of it. 
heard of him. And he said, well, watch this video. And I said, you know, I really don't have an hour to, or an hour and 15 minutes, I think it was, to watch a video. But I respect my friend Richard so greatly that if he tells me this is a must-watch, do-not-miss video, I will spend an hour and 15 minutes watching the video. I did. And I was astonished by the depth, the precision, the knowledge, the clarity, and the bravery of the speaker, Ken Rola. So I immediately did what I always do. I contacted him. And I said, I don't know you, but I want to know you. And let's talk about what you do and what you know and how you got there and how we can potentially think about working together. That started a fascinating conversation. And I said, you know, I can't keep this to myself. You have to be on the doctor and the truth report. He said, I'd love to. And here we have him tonight. Good evening, Ken. Good evening. I'm so glad you could join us. So very, very glad because I think the things that you're doing, the things that you know, and the things that you've experienced can literally make the world a better and safer place for every single one of us. And that's pretty important. Well, thank you. I've, I've been a very big fan of yours and uh, Ralph and General Stubblebond for probably the past 10 years. So you've been a big part of my education. Thank you. Thank you. Let's start with your website, Ken. It's very important. People will need to go there. There are technologies and uh, there is information there that you absolutely do not want to go another day without. Ken, give us your website, please. Okay. My main website is freshandalive.com. Um, that's where we sell our products. Uh, I also have a blog, which is where I have most of my information which is beyond rawfoods.com. And then uh, for people that want to kind of follow the latest things I'm discovering, uh, if you follow me on Facebook, uh, I'm on Facebook, and that's where I post a lot of stuff uh, that I don't get time to do on the blog. So uh, okay. that's the main place. Now, uh, let me read a little bit about you, and you can expand on this. I think this is uh, uh, such a fascinating trajectory that you follow. Uh, you are a natural health educator and an inventor you, from New Smyrna Beach, Florida, and you've been teaching classes and retreats for a long time, specifically since 1993 on rejuvenation, cellular regeneration using raw and sprouted vegetarian food, herbs, food-based natural supplements, detox, emotional healing, reprogramming of limited unconscious beliefs, and ancient esoteric techniques. You combine that with cutting edge science. And when I say cutting edge folks, I'm talking about knock your socks off cutting edge. With a background in electrical engineering, physics, and computer science, gee, you're smarter than my smartphone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> areas, you for twenty three years you've worked at a variety of jobs in the medical industry from the patent le from the patient level to the national policy level. As a cutting edge researcher, you have studied with many pioneers in the natural health movement, including Edward Cousins, Brian and Anna Maria Clement, David Wolf, Robert Morris, Victoria Victoria uh, always a tough name for me to say. Brenda Cobb, and lots of others. In 2005, you became certified as a natural health educator by the Hippocrates Health Institute in West Palm Beach, Florida, and as a guest lecturer there. In 2006, you were honored to work with Loretta Scott King, who, as I think everyone knows, is the wife of the late Dr. Martin Luther King. I would love to know what you were doing working with Coretta King, and you have, you have a breadth and a, a range of activities that are simply astonishing. One of the things that you do that I like the most is you simply give people information so that they can make their own devices and change 
her and why did they so choose? And I would love to have you tell us how how you followed this trajectory, how you got to do what you're doing right now, and where you're going. And let's let's move the conversation to radiation mm. so that we can talk about the sound with mediation. Okay. Well, it was a long and winding road getting to where I'm at. Um, but uh, suffice it to say, I, I I was sick early on in my life. I worked in the medical system for 23 years and looked to the medical system for answers to my health problems and couldn't find them there. And so then wound up exploring how to heal myself. And in the course of doing that, uh, learned how to to heal. Uh, regenerate cells and heal the mind and the emotions and the body. And so uh, over time, people just started asking me about uh, how to do it and why I live the way that I live, and that kind of stuff. And so that was how I got into teaching natural health. My educational background is actually in electrical engineering. But I worked for 23 years in the medical system doing various jobs. Um, I was a computer programmer and IT professional for many years. Um, and I've been a radio DJ. I've had a lot of different unusual things in my background. Um, and so, uh, so I've got this new mash of uh, experiences that um, give me a different perspective on things when I'm looking at uh, solutions to problems. So with radiation, um, one of the things that uh, seems to be very surprising to people is that there are actually methods for neutralizing radioactivity. Um, and um, I've actually created a web page uh, with links for people to go to and to look at and to get uh, data on this because I know a lot of times when I talk about some of these concepts and, and information that I discuss, people think it's nonsense or pseudoscience or a new age nonsense. So, so let me give everybody uh, a web address that they go to when they can see uh, the proof of what I'm talking about and what I will be talking about. That link is Radiation Links, L I N K S, Radiation Links dot fresh and alive dot com. So if you go there, uh, I put together lots and lots of links there with uh, the evidence of what I'm going to be talking about. So, first of all, um, one of the things that I always like to talk about are the fundamentals of how matter and energy work and what radioactivity is. Because if you understand the fundamentals, then when you start describing the methods for for neutralizing radioactivity, uh, it doesn't sound like a bunch of uh, a bunch of science fiction. Uh, I wonder. I wonder if you would give a, a quick view for those people who might not remember it of. Uh, what the conventional view, the nuclear physics uh, dogma about radiation and uh, uh, half lives, and why what you're going to say is not thought about uh, clearly by nuclear physicists and nuclear engineers. Well, the conventional concept that I was taught when I was in school. Uh, are that uh, that radioactivity is kind of inherent in the material that it, it comes from the material itself, and uh, but of course uh, nuclear physicists don't exactly know where. Uh, it just oh it emanates from this this material and therefore it's the source of it. When in fact what really is going on is that these nuclear material materials are more like antennas for uh, energy that gets converted into radioactivity and, and emits from them. And so for example there was a uh, there was an experiment that was done uh, not too long ago where scientists put radioactive elements down a 17,000-foot oil well and discovered that uh, after a few hours of being at that depth, uh, apparently they were shielded enough from cosmic radiation and the sun, they became non-radioactive. And when they brought them back to the surface, they stayed non-radioactive for about three days. So there's one method right there of um, Stopping radioactivity is if you properly shield radioactive elements. And don't ask me what proper shielding is, but uh, obviously we can't send all of the Fukushima radiation 17,000 feet underground. But it, it shows that the nature of radioactivity is not what uh, scientists have thought it was. Um, now, this, this piece of information, by the way, is as revolutionary as, uh, let me think 
of something that as uh, a scientist proving definitively that uh, pigs can sprout wings when you uh, when you chant at them and paint them blue. It's that revolutionary. Except that my example, of course, is nonsense, and this is hard science. Extraordinary. Right. right, and that's just one example, but uh, but it stems from understanding the real nature of matter and energy, and that was something that, you know, when I went to engineering school, I was taught this is the way things are, and, uh, and uh, even in school, I questioned that, uh, and quite often I would butt heads with my professors because they would say, well, we've got this phenomena in nuclear physics that we don't understand. Um, and they would just kind of you know, write it off as magic or whatever. And I said, well, I think I understand how that works. And I, was, I created, for example, a mathematical model one time of how uh, there's an effect called tunneling in nuclear physics where certain, certain uh, nuclear particles appear to pass through the nuclei of atoms. And um, that would be the equivalent of shooting a spit wad with a straw through a brick wall. It's just impossible for it to happen. And nobody had an explanation for it. So well, I think I don't understand how it works. And I made a mathematical model for it. I went to my professor, who was the chairman of the Department of Physics at Arizona State at the time. And uh, he said, uh, why are you worried about this? You should be worried about getting an A on your lab. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> they do things like that. Because, uh, yeah. uh, I mean, a student couldn't possibly come up with any answers to anything. So it wasn't until I met Linus Pauling years later when I presented to him. He said, he said, this is brilliant. You should pursue this. And it was like being smacked upside the head all the time. It's like, wow, I've, I've been going to the wrong schools all along. <laughs> um, uh, but the truth it is, is that, uh, you know, physicists and, and scientists are being taught information that was passed on from people previous to them. And um, they didn't really understand the true nature of matter and energy and how it worked. And therefore, for example, like it's been discovered, uh, there's a German uh, physicist named Constantine Mild who actually proved the, uh, uh, the unified field theory or, or equation, which is an equation that describes all matter and energy at uh, any scale from galactic to subatomic. And Einstein and his contemporaries had worked on it all their careers and could never figure it out. And Mild discovered the reason they couldn't figure it out was because they didn't believe that anything could go faster than the speed of light. Well, now it's been discovered with like the Hadron Collider in Europe and, and other experiments that there are many types of particles and waves that can go way beyond the speed of light, what we've been told of the speed of light. And in fact, uh, scalar waves, which is a certain type of energy we'll talk about, can go far beyond what we've been told of the speed of light. And so, so there are some fundamental assumptions going on in physics about the nature of matter and energy that are flawed, but we can create working models to do things like, you know, create devices and things that work. But it, it's kind of like um, it's kind of like using a metaphor or an, an analogy instead of understanding the true nature of things. And therefore, you can only go so far with it. So the standard dogma with nuclear materials is, is that the radioactivity is emanating from, you know, the nuclei of the material itself, and um, that uh, it takes. You know, many, it takes a long time for this stuff to decay, depending on the material, and there's nothing that can be done necessarily to accelerate that decay. Well, uh, one of the things that I posted on that uh, links page was a link to 61 patents worldwide for methods for transmuting and making non-radioactive radioactive elements. So, so there's at least 61 patents out in the world, eight of them Japanese, for neutralizing radioactive elements. And radioactive waste. Uh, and of course, that's not being taught in schools, or none of these concepts are being taught in schools because it would not only uh, eliminate the nuclear power industry, which is essentially just a justification for the nuclear weapons industry, um, but it would also imply free energy and a complete change in our physics that would break the whole control paradigm that's going on on the planet. And so the people or the countries with nuclear power, nuclear weapons that have the nuclear advantage would lose their advantage overnight if this information came out. And so even though there's all these patents for neutralizing radioactivity, I mean, you would think that at least somebody in the nuclear industry in Japan, if not elsewhere in the world, would know at least about a few of these patents. I mean, any monkey can go Google it and find it, um, you know, if you're looking for it. So... Um, so the bottom line is that we've been fed a bunch of nonsense in our educational process, and not just with physics and science, but really everything from art and literature to everything else. It's, you know, who 
whoever owns the uh, uh, controls the paradigm is controls the information that's disseminated. And so within the scientific community, information is heavily, heavily controlled to uh, create a paradigm that profits the, the folks that have the money and the power in, in, in the current situation. So, so there have been many, many people that have figured out, um, going back to ancient times, figured out that the true nature of matter. Um, there was uh, a man named Elmer Nemus in the 1950s who developed a microscope that could see, optically see, atomic structure. Now, a tunneling electron microscope, which is supposedly the best technology we have for looking at, at atomic structure, can only magnify to about 60,000 times, and uh, it can only see atoms as little knobs, little nodules, or little blobs. But in the 50s, Nemus developed this optical scope that was really, really brilliant that uh, could magnify millions of times, and he could see and took pictures of, optical pictures of, the internal structures of atoms. And it's absolutely mind-blowing. If you, I've provided a link to that on the link page. If you go and search on NEMASCOPE, N-E-M-E, -E, uh, scope, you can see these pictures that uh, he took. And they were extremely high resolution, and they were in the true colors of the atomic structures, which is just mind-blowing. So the, the, the true nature of atomic structure and uh, how matter and energy really work have been known for thousands of years, and it's been written and talked about, and uh, many, many people have uh, sacrificed themselves and their careers and sometimes their lives for getting the truth out, only to have it suppressed and squashed over and over again. Um, I worked with a man, for example, in the early 90s named Google Brown, who developed a water fuel technology that could neutralize radioactivity and uh, what he would do is uh, pulse electricity through water, but not in the conventional uh, standard electrolysis that, you know, scientists will tell you standard electrolysis takes more energy to split water than it, uh, going into it than you get out of it. But uh, Brown and other people developed this method where uh, you could do it inside of metal tubes with certain diameters and alloys and you would develop explosive force resonance and break the water molecules apart with very little energy and, and create this gas that could be burned. And uh, the gas would uh, burn with a blue flame, but you could run your hand through it and it would feel cold. But when you would put it to anything to burn it or melt it, it would react with it at the atomic level, and so you could, uh, you could transmutate elements from one to another. And uh, so Brown did exactly that to neutralize radioactivity. Uh, he would mix uh, iron and I believe aluminum with radioactive elements and burn them, and you would get this kind of explosive reaction like a, like a thermite bomb, and then it would be left with non-radioactive elements. Now, to a lot of people, that may sound like nonsense or pseudoscience or, uh, you know, absolute outright lies, but uh, transmutation of elements, particularly radioactive elements, occurs all the time in nature. Uh, radioactivity itself is a transmutation process where radionuclides are decaying into other elements. So it's not this nonsensical alchemy of turning lead into gold, that kind of stuff. It happens all the time uh, in nature. And in fact, it occurs in the human body. Uh, there was a man named, a French man, a scientist named Louis Cravan, who proved that transmutation of elements occurs inside of living uh, organisms, including human beings. Uh, so, for example, if a human body needs calcium and it doesn't have, if it's not ingesting enough calcium, it can actually convert silica into calcium. So, transmutation of elements occurs in nature all the time. It certainly occurs in um, nuclear processes and reactions all the time. And so it doesn't seem so pie in the sky to be able to control that reaction or accelerate that reaction to make elements become non-radioactive. And in fact, that's what most of these 61 patents for making radioactive waste non-radioactive do. They accelerate the decay uh, so that rather than taking months or years or millennia, it only takes a few hours or a few days or a few weeks. Uh, and so there, there have been... Uh, many people have done that. I personally witnessed uh, Yule Brown do it with a team of engineers and physicists and inventors with measuring equipment. Um, there was also uh, a brilliant professor uh, at Arizona State University and who in 1975 uh, developed a method for neutralizing radioactivity. His name was Radha Roy, that's R-A-D-H-A-R-O-Y. Uh, Professor Emeritus of Physics at Arizona State University develops a method for neutralizing radioactivity by accelerating the decay, and um, it was very well 
did uh, you know, he published papers on it, made videos about it, and uh, it went nowhere. It was suppressed. Uh, later, uh, Los Alamos Labs took his technique and uh, utilized it for doing the very same thing. Um, and so, so the good news is there are many, many, many ways to neutralize radioactivity. And the, the bad news is that it's not being allowed out into the public eye. And um, uh, my belief is probably for, for multiple agendas, but one of them, of course, is the breaking of the existing control paradigm and energy paradigm, but I think also it's about population reduction. Um, so, um, so, you know, there you have it. I mean, it, you know, as far as radioactivity, you know, I can talk about the nature of radioactivity a little bit more and how it really works, because this, you know, ultimately the, the question and that people ask me is, what can I do about this? And that's what I focus on my teaching is, teaching average people what they can do to protect themselves against all these different kinds of threats to our health. Let's uh, well, well, talk about the nature of radiation and then talk about how we can solve Fukushima and the other radiation disasters around the world. And then let's talk about what we individually can do to protect ourselves and the people that we love. Okay. Well, to understand what radioactivity is, you have to understand the nature of matter and energy a little bit um, uh, through uh, three-dimensional reality. Um, you know, there's some brilliant, brilliant scientists uh, who are coming out and, uh, and explaining very fundamentally how things work in the universe. One of them is uh, Nassim Harriman, who is a physicist um, in Hawaii uh, with the Resonance Project. There's Constantine Mile. Who's a German professor of physics, uh, one of the preeminent skater physicists in the world. There's uh, Thomas E. Beardman, who was a uh, former NASA nuclear engineer. Uh, Konstantin Karatkov, a Russian physicist. Uh, there was a man named Nikolai Kozarev, another Russian physicist. George Lakovsky, yet another one. Uh, William A. Rhodes, back in the early 1960s, who developed water fuel technology. Uh, Andrea Kuharic, uh, Stanley Meyer, Victor Schauberger, on and on. There's just tons of them. Wilhelm Reich. There's a whole lot of scientists who have very good credentials who have demonstrated that how things work. And so, essentially, uh, what happens with radioactivity is you you have this faster than light energy traveling through the cosmos that. Uh, physicists now are calling scalar energy or scalar waves, and it's a subtle energy that travels far beyond the speed of light that um, spirals as it goes, and it branches as it goes, and uh, so it's spiraling and fractaling throughout the universe, and it's really kind of like the fabric of the universe. It's, it's what creates the matter and energy that we can see and measure in our 3D reality. And it comes from the centers of galaxies, probably from the centers of universes, and it's relayed outward from the centers of galaxies and it spirals outward. And it, it is relayed from the centers of suns and the centers of planets outward from the center of the galaxy out to the edges of the galaxies. And uh, Nassim Harriman is figuring out that the centers of suns and planets have singularities inside of them or black holes. Um, uh, but they're really not what most people would conceive of as black holes because they they actually are or more like a uh, combination of a black hole funnel that sucks energy in and a white hole that transmits it out. And what what really is going on, if you look at galaxies or suns or planets uh, or even human bodies or cells or atoms, is that they all have these toroidal fields that energy flows from the centers outward around the outside of the donut. Toroid is just a donut shape. So the energy flows out of the singularity at the center of the donut, around the donut, and back in the other side of the donut hole um, into uh, the back side of the singularity. So our galaxy, which uh, looks like a disk, is actually energetically structured like a big giant uh, donut, and the energy flows from the center of it outward uh, around relays through all these suns and planets and ultimately relays back into the center of the galaxy. Um, that energy is uh, 
way beyond the speed of light, and it actually slows down and coagulates into the matter and energy of our three-dimensional reality. And so it's been shown through epigenetics, people like Dr. Bruce Lipton and others, looking at what goes on in cells at the, um, at the atomic level, that um, it's actually consciousness that slows this energy down and brings it into form. And there's actually evidence of this in physics. Uh, there's something called the double blind experiment, or excuse me, a double slit experiment, where uh, you can observe light coming through uh, slits in a, uh, a piece of paper or, or a, a, a membrane of some kind. And sometimes it acts like particles, and sometimes it acts like acts like waves. And that's what uh, physicists, physicists call particle wave duality, and they argue back and forth about whether or not uh, the nature of matter and energy is a particle or a wave. Well, in fact, it's this faster than light uh, state or energy that will become a particle or a wave depending on what consciousness does with it. Uh, and that's been consistent with observations in physics that the observer has an effect on subatomic structure and what occurs in the subatomic structure of the atoms. So, so it's literally human consciousness that takes this fast of the light scale or energy that's vortexing and branching and fractaling as it goes and slowing it down and coagulating into the matter and energy that we can see and, and measure. Well, now you so say it's human consciousness. Can you say it's human consciousness? Uh, this was going on a long time before there were humans, before there were um, bacteria, before there were primordial uh, uh, creatures. So, how and the parts of the universe that are going through their process that don't have sentient anything, as far as we know, uh, is still uh, experiencing this. So, help me understand how. Well, I didn't say it's not just it's not just human consciousness. It's not just human consciousness, um, and we also. Um, we make the assumption that, that uh, there's not other consciousness in the universe that's not physical. Um, but at least with physicality, this has been observed that, that consciousness, and not just human consciousness, slows this energy down and coagulates it into physical matter and energy that we can measure. Um, Thomas Bearden, for example, uh, he applied for a patent um, for neutralizing radioactivity, and I thought it was pretty brilliant that in the patent application, he noted that he got the idea for accelerating the, the decay of the radioactive materials by observing what occurs in human cells, and he discovered that the way that human cells regenerate is actually by working through these superconducting monatomic elements in our tissue. They would use the scalar energy to actually go back in time and find the genetic pattern for the healthy cell and bring it into the present and create a new cell based on that pattern from the past. And so, um, you know, a patent application doesn't prove that it's true, but uh, it's certainly a very, very uh, interesting concept. Ken, was the, uh, Ken, was the patent actually uh, issued? Uh, I don't know if it was issued or not. All right. Uh, All right. The reason I ask is that there, there's case law that says that... Um, an approved patent, an issued patent, is substantiation of the claims uh, that are made in that patent. In other words, the FDA and the FTC have to um, give give honor honor and and uh, and accept the decisions of the patent office when it comes to claims. So, um, if yeah. that patent was issued, then, for example, the FTC could not say uh, that it's uh, uh, that it's a, a false uh, claim. Um, to say that the methodology reduces radiation. Uh, one yeah, of the no, problems no, we're no, all no, facing, no. you know, one of the problems, Ken, that we, we face, and, and as you know, Dr. Rima uh, uh, and I have been working with General Burt, um, Ambassador Murata, and, uh, and, uh, and Professor Busby on cr the creation of IC Safer. One of our concerns is uh, the way the authorities are going to treat uh, these various claims, and it's a very powerful if we can find some uh, patented but not widely understood uh, uh, technologies that can be applied here. 
Right, and as far as the neutralizing radioactivity, like I say, there there are 61 patents that were were approved for neutralizing radioactivity. So I would think at least one or two of them would stick to the wall. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as Bearden's Bearden's work, he he actually had to go into hiding because he developed free energy technology, a bunch of other really interesting stuff. Um, but uh, my my philosophy has always been, I don't I don't care what people's data are, what you know what they say, I want to see results. And so. Mm -hmm. You know, I've seen, I have seen results with Joel Brown and working with other people, neutralizing radioactivity and doing other things that uh, people might think of science fiction. But, uh, but the point of it is that this, uh, this faster than light scalar energy is being much better understood by uh, heavy duty scientists on the planet. They've been talking about it, writing about it for decades. Um, Constantine Mile actually proved the um, unified field equation, and of course, uh, is being heavily contested by the scientific community. But um, and that's typically the way things go. But at any rate, this the, what I was getting at with all of this this scalar energy is how it relates to radioactivity. And so, so in uh, atomic elements, there are certain kinds of um, elements that their nuclei can act as antennas for this energy and bring it into 3D space-time uh, and have various effects. And so with radioactive elements, this uh, scalar energy flows through their nuclei and excites uh, atomic particles and structure to emit the radiation. And so but this, the thing about scalar waves is they, they pass through matter like it's not even there. They pass through planets typically like they're not even there. And so I was very surprised to see this experiment with the taking the radioactive elements and putting them at the bottom of uh, 17,000 foot wells and seeing the radiation stop. I wouldn't have thought that was possible because typically the scalar waves pass right through planets. Um, but at any rate, radioactivity is coming from outside the element, from the cosmos, and in, in our planet is coming from the sun, from the cosmos, and from the center of the earth, according to Nancy and Harriman. These scalar waves come up through the earth from a, a singularity inside the planet, which also explains a lot of things that are unexplained in physics now, like gravitation, magnetism, and electricity. Scientists can measure it, talk about it, but they can't explain the true nature of it. Uh, and so, so these new models that these people are coming up with do explain it mathematically as well as experimentally. Uh, so, so, so let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Since uh, radiation is, in this model, not internal to the nuclear radiation, is not internal to the, to the molecule, to the element, uh, if you remediate the radiation, if you transmute it, what is to keep it from retransmitting back to another radioactive form? That's a good question. Um, essentially, a radioactive element is an antenna for this scalar energy that creates the radioactivity in the material. And so if you alter the atomic structure so that it's no longer picking up the, uh, or transmitting that, or converting that uh, scalar energy into uh, the radiation, then you, know, you, you can essentially transmute the element, change its atomic structure, and it's no longer an antenna for that scalar energy that creates that uh, frequency, that damaging frequency of energy. Uh, and in fact, that's exactly what uh, the vast majority of these patents uh, mention, is that they're transmuting the nuclear structure of the materials. Um, and so, so when you change it, and, and, and that happens naturally in, in um, transmutation of um, atomic elements through decay. Uh, many of them will decay into non-radioactive elements. So, um, so it's kind of a natural process. These uh, patent uh, applications are using techniques that radically accelerate the decay, essentially, so that the material transmutes itself at a much faster rate. Given this, do you believe that it is possible, assuming that we can generate sufficient resources, to actually remediate the radiation at Fukushima? Oh, I have no doubt. I have no doubt. I mean, uh, like I say, I 
witnessed it done with Ewell Brown, so I'm certain that method worked. Um, but uh, there, you know, there are other people that have done demonstrations uh, of their technology as well. Rada Roy, for example, the professor at Arizona State, um, you know, you go to YouTube and you can see videos of him discussing it, and he's got the scientific proof. You know, it's proven. And like I say, Los Alamos Labs took that technique and they used it. So it's known. It's there. You know, there are techniques that are known to work. It's not like, oh gosh, gee, maybe they work. There are plenty of them that do work, and it's been documented, shown by well-credentialed people, um, and followed up with by other um, laboratories. So it's really a matter of why isn't this technology being allowed to be used to clean up the radioactivity? That's and that's the real question. question. What do you believe the answer to that essential question is? Well, having worked in these esoteric areas with free energy and stuff, I mean, I've, I've had friends who were assassinated and, and shot at and threatened. I've been threatened. Um, so I know that uh, you know, when you're operating outside of the, the mainstream paradigm that um, uh, you see a lot of information that average people don't see that would think is just conspiratorial. But having having been involved with those kinds of things and also working in the medical establishment for 23 years, my impression is the reason this radioactivity is not being allowed uh, to be cleaned up, there are probably a combination of things. I think some of it may be that uh, the Japanese government and the people involved don't want to lose faith. Maybe there's some of that. But I think the main reason is population reduction. I, mm -hmm. My impression is um, I've been studying the United Nations population reports for years, and I teach about them in my workshops. I, I mentioned some of the information from them, and it was shocking to me years ago when I first saw them that, surprisingly, the United Nations reports that I saw weren't terribly concerned about overpopulation. They said that it would kind of take care of itself through starvation, <laughs> which was mind-blowing to me. Uh, so I, I think that there's a, a desire by the people who manage this planet that have the power and the money to reduce the population, kind of like you would a herd of cattle, just to make it more manageable and to reduce the stress on the resources and the environment of the planet. Which, I mean, that that's probably a maybe a, a an excuse, a public excuse, because in fact, if we were allowed to have these free energy technologies out, we could have many more people on the planet that we have now and feed them and be have a a clean environment, and not destroy the planet. Um, but of course, that would completely destroy the control paradigm. Exactly. So I think it's about population reduction and maintaining control. When you say you've been threatened, um, how serious were those threats? Well, uh, I've had people come up to me after I've given presentations and tell me I better stop or I'm going to get hurt. And um, having had friends that were killed, for producing free energy and, and things that threaten the existing paradigm, uh, I take that very seriously uh, because the, uh, I know they did sometimes. Some of these guys, uh, there were, for example, Stanley Meyer, who produced water fuel technology. Uh, he was threatened many times, and he believed that he was protected by angels and by God, that nothing was going to happen to him. And, uh, and so he kept pressing to get his technology out, and ultimately, he, uh, was poisoned after signing a $34 million contract with the U.S. military to power their vehicles with water. So having been around it up close, I, um, I take any threat seriously. Um, we understand that. Well, I think, and I think that's, uh, that's correct. Uh, my next question is, why are you still doing what you're doing? What drives uh, you? To, uh, to know that this is dangerous and to continue anyway. Well, I, I'm not doing anything, I, I don't think, that can get me in uh, trouble. Um, you know, I'm telling about other people's technologies, I'm sharing the information and knowledge about, you know, the solutions, but I'm not creating free energy, I'm not doing any of these things uh, that would, um, as far as I know, um, draw the ire of these people uh, to, you know, to kill me or hurt me, but so, but I, you know, even so, I have taken steps so that if anything happens to me, the, the information that I have collected uh, would get disseminated widely uh, globally to a large audience. Good. Uh, but I, I really just don't think, I haven't done anything that, um, 
that would uh, be significant enough compared to all these other people out there with these other methods. Well, let's, let's talk about uh, some of the other technological applications. By the way, I'm very excited about the, the radiation um, remediation knowledge that you have and the potential, and I look forward to finding where to work together and be very serious about the Fukushima issue. We are looking currently for our startup funding of $100,000 to tax deductible to uh, organize IFT Safer. And if anybody out there listening wants to contribute a dollar, $10, $1,000, $10,000, $100,000 to take the technology, the candidate technologies that we're talking about and more and deploy them in what I call the anti-Manhattan project right. uh, model. The Manhattan project was secret and it was just, it was focused on creating destructiveness of a type that the world has never seen before. We are talking about creating health and health and doing it totally openly without any secrecy, secrecy whatsoever. So, All right, we are reaching the midpoint on the program, Dr. Rima. Back in a bit, folks. There is no denying the world is awakening. We see revolution. Radio. You're listening to the Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener supported radio, and now we return you to your host.
coffee mother's blood pressure. It's really quite extraordinary. Of course, if it's laced with horrible chemicals, it's not real good for you. And the pathological effects of coffee are the pathological effects of the chemicals. They're actually irrelevant, and the coffee has nothing to do with it. But if you lace it with horrible chemicals, it's going to give you heart palpitations, make you sick. So clean coffee is not only a delight, but it's also uh, a way of helping to heal you and helping to heal the earth. Um, you can get this coffee, but you can't buy it. If you go to www.valleyofthemooncoffee.org, valleyofthemooncoffee.org or .com, and you make a donation of $25 or more, we'll send you a half pound bag of the coffee you pay the shipping. If you purchase, no, it's not purchase. If you make a donation equivalent to five bags of coffee, half pound bags, we will send you six half pound bags. And you can either use them for stock, stocking stuffers and corporate gifts for the people that you want to show that you respect and care about, or you can keep them for yourself, or you can give five away and keep one for yourself. But you'll want more because it is the best coffee you've ever tasted. Of that, I have no doubt. So that's $25 in donation plus the shipping cost, and we will send you Health Freedom Dairy Own Coffee. You don't like coffee? Fine. Make a donation in some other, in some amount that represents your commitment to health freedom. It's tax deductible. End of year giving is here. We depend on your generosity to be able to fight for your health freedom. Um, I want to go one more time to the website, www.valleyofthemooncoffee.com. And now I want to talk about geoengineering. We talked about, I talked a moment ago, about the earth being farmed the way it's meant to be um, tended. And that doesn't involve destroying our atmosphere, preventing sunlight from reaching the planet, uh, dumping heavy metals and uh, synthetic DNA and uh, genetically engineered viruses down on top of us. Let's talk about geoengineering and let's talk about protection from geoengineering. Talk to us, Ken. Okay, well, first, I think I'd like to say that uh, one great thing you can do with coffee that relates to all of this is rather than putting it in your mouth, you can put it up your rear end and do an animal <laughs> and uh, toss it by your body. And you, you so that's a great use for it. It is a great use, and we always say that you can enjoy Valley of the Moon coffee standing on your feet or your head. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. It's clean, it's pristine, and it is yeah. a wonderful wonderful thing to use as an enema if that is something that you understand and um, uh, see your health involved with. Uh, you're quite right. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so geoengineering. Um, well, first of all, um, a lot of people think that chemtrails and geoengineering are just a conspiracy theory. So to dispel that myth, um, I've put links on that link page. Again, again is um, radiationlinks.freshandalive.com. Right. And uh, I've got links to um, a YouTube video by Professor uh, of Applied Physics at Harvard, David Keith, who is Time Magazine 2009 Hero of the Environment, who um, proposes a uh, not only proposes, but is uh, working with other scientists to spray 10 to 20 million metric tons of uh, sulfur and metal aerosols in the atmosphere every year. And so uh, Keith and others say they don't want to do this, but uh, that this is the only way they know how to supposedly stop global warming and uh, they need to do this. And so we need to have a public discussion about it, even though they agree that it's abhorrent and they don't want to do it. Uh, <laughs> Just wait a minute. Uh, uh, these yeah. people have no ethics, is what you're saying. Well, I, I mean, don't know. I mean, you know, you know, maybe they truly believe what they're saying, but uh, 
one thing that they say the reason they're doing this is that they are emulating what volcanoes do. When, when volcanoes erupt, they emit large amounts of uh, ash and rock power that go up into the atmosphere, and one volcano can lower the uh, atmosphere's temperature globally by about a half degree. So they don't believe they have any personal responsibility for their own actual actions. Uh, you know, this is, right. you know, this is a, you know, this is sad. It really is uh, that they, yeah, that I mean, they I think they can. I don't buy the argument, but I'll, I'll, you know, I'll just yeah. go along with the game that okay, they, they truly believe what they're saying. But if they were really, yeah. if they were really wanting to emulate volcanoes, then why not stoke spraying toxic aluminum and barium and strontium and, and other biological agents? Uh, why not just spray rock powders, which would remineralize the earth and be extremely Absolutely. healing to the earth, just like volcanic eruptions? And that's uh, very and interesting, Ken. Because what you've just told us is that there's a natural solution, one that a number of us have known about for many years, and boy, rock dust made it as amazing things with home gardens. Um, but that natural solution is there. It's obvious. There's a large amount of rock dust produced uh, in quarries on this planet every year, and yet it's not being pursued. Right, and, and rock dust also not only will it remineralize plants, but it also can be used for remediating uh, radiation in the Tell environment. Us. Uh, Tell us. There's a, actually on that links page, there is a paper by, um, uh, let's see, who is it? Uh, I forget what the professor's name is, but there is a, there's a paper on there using rock dust to um, to remediate pollution in plants by just simply by feeding the rock dust. Uh, there's also a Japanese professor named Tiro Ohiga who's using bacteria uh, and I had mentioned this to Dr. Rima previously when I spoke to her. There is a uh, professor at the University of Birmingham in England named uh, Lynn McCaskey, who, uh, PhD, who uh, is using E. coli bacteria to break down radioactive elements into non-radioactive. So, um, so, so, so the, I want to I want to point out that spraying racks and rock dust in the air. Uh, has a little problem with anything that breathes. <laughs> so, well, right, oftentimes it's, 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 it's the recommendations it's are like put in the ocean. It depends on how much you do it. You know, it's like volcanic eruptions are not that frequent, and they, on the one hand, they devastate the life around them in the immediate area, but what's also interesting is that um, they bring back life to the area very, very quickly because these uh, volcanic rock powders have high levels of monoatomic minerals that are, they act like uh, antennas or lenses for the scale of energy traveling through the cosmos, and they bring it into um, microbes and plants and um, allow them to actually sometimes feed directly off the energy that they bring in. Um, and that's why, for example, you can see on growing on the sides of uh, volcanic rock that's just flowed out of a, uh, a volcano that's hardened up, you'll see plants growing directly off of hard lava, and it's because they are so high in these monoatomics, they are bringing in the scalar energy the plants can convert directly into matter. This is uh, true, plants, but I, I want to point out that the, uh, the well-known health effect of volcanic eruption is um, respiratory disaster often around the world if it's a huge volcano like Krakatoa. So um, I understand exactly what you're saying about the, the mineral content and the energetic uh, connection, but before we run off and substitute something else disastrous. <laughs> well, you don't have to do it at all. The truth is it's totally unnecessary. If you're not polluting the environment the way we're doing um, and using these ridiculous hydrocarbons, burning hydrocarbons to uh, fuel things, um, there's absolutely no need for that. There's multiple, multiple um, implosive force technologies that have been available on the planet for hundreds of years that could power everything uh, very inexpensively and be, not only be non-toxic, but could clean up the mess. It could clean up radioactivity, clean up polluted water. Uh, Stanley Myers water fill technology, for example, uh, this uh, pulse hydrolysis uh, or electrolysis, uh, it would, uh, he could take polluted water, even radioactive water, and the process would pull the H2O out of the mixture and then precipitate it out as pure water, leave behind the waste, whether it was radioactive or not, and then you could burn it with the gas and transmute it into non-toxic elements and recycle it. 
So um, there's no need to be spraying rock powders or metal powders or any of this nonsense. Right. We could clean up the atmosphere very quickly if we would just switch to non-destructive uh, implosive force technology for power generation. Um, but there are lots of different options out there. Um, so anyway, with, with geoengineering and chemtrailing, for people that think it may just be a conspiracy theory, you can go on YouTube or Google and just Google geoengineering or uh, chemtrails and, and go to um, YouTube and search on David Keith, and you will see many lectures by him and other geoengineers, highly credentialed people, talking about it, admitting it. They're not hiding. Uh, they did say that several years ago it was highly politically incorrect to even speak about it, so for many years they were doing it but not talking about it. Uh, so it's not a conspiracy theory at all. Correct. It's, uh, it's a scientific fact. And there are a couple of movies out that document uh, a lot of what's going on and why it's going on. There, there's a movie called What in the World Are They Spraying, which you can see on YouTube in its entirety for free. And another one made by the same people called Why in the World Are They Spraying? And uh, they, they interview scientists and lots of different people to explain what's really going on and show what evidence is known about what's going on. So it's not all conspiracy theory. Um, exactly. You know, the question is, why is it going on and, um, and what can we do about it? Um, they address those in those movies. Some of the reasons are, for example, aluminum, the geoengineers will tell you they use it because it's highly reflective and it's very light and it stays up in the atmosphere a long time. But it, it's really stupid to use it because it's a fire accelerant. Um, aluminum powder is what you put into fireworks to make them explode and burn. And so when these metal powders come down on plants and forests, they make forest fires much, much worse, um, which is exactly what happened in California a few years ago. It had a rash of really bad forest fires. Um, uh, but then there's also the agenda of promoting GMOs because, uh, as it turns out, you spray these aluminum powders, they come down, they land on the soil, and aluminum blocks the uptake of nutrients to plants. And it just so happens that Monsanto has come out with uh, patents on GMO seeds and crops that are aluminum resistant and withstand those metal powders and grow them. So it's a great way to stop organics and force a GMO uh, standard across the world. Um, there are military objectives in using these um, geoengineering formulas because they, they can manipulate weather, so you can therefore engineer food supplies, you can, you can threaten food supplies to countries or, or shut off food supplies and create droughts and uh, storms, all kinds of stuff that can create political chaos, um, which can even you know, bring people out of power if it's bad enough. Um, you can also manip manipulate commodity and stock prices by manip manipulating crops around the world. Um, so there, there are different agendas which they cover in those movies, particularly why in the world they spraying. Um, some of the effects of these metal powders uh, that have been documented, and particularly in these movies, they, they show different documentation of this. Uh, they make the soil too alkaline by hundreds of times. Um, and as I said, they block plant nutrient absorption, and of course they toxify people, land, food supplies, water supplies, they weaken our immune systems, they go into the brain and they, uh, they um, shunt brain neural pathways so that uh, it affects brain function negatively, um, causes brain and nervous system damage, uh, and also it causes severe weather uh, because when you're putting these metal particulates in the atmosphere, you're creating highly ionized charged particles that will make lightning more severe and make all kinds of severe weather from drought, heat, cold, floods, uh, all of that. So uh, it's been shown by people who are creating devices to clear this stuff that when, when you clear it out, the weather normalizes. Um, now, so, you just said when you clear it out, the weather normalizes. Uh, most people would not have any idea how they can clear out chemtrails. So okay. it's terribly, terribly important. Okay. Well, there's a Russian physicist named Alexander Golod, uh, G-O-L-O-D. He's listed on the links page that I put out. And uh, 
He was a heavy-duty uh, Cold War scientist working for the Russian government. He had a multi-million-dollar-year budget, and um, when the Cold War ended, he was um, looking for research to do, and he decided to study pyramids. I assume probably the Russian government was interested in pyramids from a weaponry standpoint. Uh, but at any rate, he did a lot of uh, interesting uh, hard science on pyramids. He discovered one thing that, uh, according to him, all of the pyramids on Earth are part of one uh, global uh, scalar energy grid system. Uh, and I noticed they just recently, a few weeks ago, uh, announced the discovery of three pyramids at the Antarctic. Antarctic. Um, but anyway, so Golov started experimenting with pyramids, and he uh, built a lot of different ones. And he built a very large one outside of Moscow, 144 feet high, and discovered a lot of very interesting things it would do. Um, it would accelerate healing in people that got near it or got inside of it. Um, sometimes people would have uh, healing of major ailments that were inside of it. Uh, it would um, detoxify polluted or radioactive water in the ground. It would uh, reduce radioactivity in the air and the atmosphere. And it would clear, clear these chemical pollutants out of the air for about a 350 kilometer diameter around the uh, pyramid. Um, one of the most mind blowing things that it did uh, that he had an interesting explanation for is it uh, wound up bringing back an extinct species of flower that had been extinct on Earth for 11 million years. Um, uh, supposedly, um, they noticed that there were some flowers growing in the fields around the pyramid and uh, didn't recognize them, so they called the botanist in to identify them and discovered they had been extinct for 11 million years. And so Golov theorized that the pyramid uh, somehow brought this scalar energy in from um, or that the pattern for everything that has ever existed or ever will is out in the quantum field, or what some people might call the Akashic Records, and the pyramids are able to bring it into form. Uh, and so that was a pretty mind-blowing uh, thing to hear, but it also gave me hope, because that means if, that, if that's true, that we could potentially bring back species that are extinct even, um, which is a very exciting prospect. Uh, but at any rate, the lot proved with a lot of uh, heavy-duty science, uh, what these pyramids could do, including remediating um, radioactivity and clearing pollutants out of the air, including geoengineering pollutants. Um, and because it would do that, it would balance the weather, and it reduced the frequency and severity of earthquakes by uh, releasing the tectonic stresses frequently in small doses rather than in large doses, and so therefore you would never have a, a large earthquake, uh, which uh, Nikola Tesla also was doing uh, back in his day with um, scalar devices that he had built. So just with pyramid technology, you can clear these things out of the sky, um, and they, uh, Golod discovered that it, it's not dropping it back down to the ground. Uh, he was concerned about that, and he actually, because of his position in the Russian government, was able to get a top secret um, type of radar that could detect scalar energy. And what he discovered was there was a huge vortex around the pyramid of the scalar waves, uh, like I said, about 350 mile kilometers. And it would actually, it would create this vortex of energy that was like an upside down tornado that would go up into space. And so it literally would pull these pollutants out into space, out of the atmosphere, rather than dropping it down. Um, and some of them, like I say, the radioactive elements, it would actually remediate them, transmute them. So, you know, you don't have to build a 140-foot high pyramid to do that. Um, you, you know, Golod was making 10-foot, 12-foot high pyramids that he would put over oil wells uh, that would reduce the viscosity of the oil and increase the production of the oil wells. Um, so, you know, people could build pyramids uh, as one method of clearing these um, these chemtrail pollutants, but in fact, there are people all over the world that are creating devices using um, smaller versions of scalar wave devices because a pyramid is basically a scalar wave transceiver. It takes the scalar energy coming from the sun and from the cosmos and from the center of the earth, 
and it focuses it and brings it into 3D space-time and uh, affects, has all these different effects. But you don't have to build a big pyramid to do that. You can, you can build devices out of a material called organite, where you essentially take crystals and metal powders and put it into a resin. Uh, for example, like fiberglass resin, if you structure it right, the resin will shrink up around the crystals, and the crystals have superconducting monoatomic elements within them that create what's called a piezoelectric effect. Um, the piezoelectric effect is when you strike a crystal, it will shoot out electricity. Certain ones will. So, for example, on a gas grill, when you press the little button on a, a gas grill to ignite it, what you're doing is smacking a piece of quartz and it shoots out electricity that uh, ignites the grill. Right. So you can take that same effect and rather than striking a crystal, if you squeeze it, it will put out skater waves. And so uh, a man back uh, in the 1930s, 50s, and Wilhelm Reich figured out how to do this with devices um, using tubes and things. Um, and was able to clean up the atmosphere and, and modify the weather and uh, stop droughts and stop floods and you know, stop, stop severe weather. Unfortunately, he was jailed and um, died in prison. Died in jail. Yep. But uh, there was a man named Karl Hans Wells, uh, an Austrian uh, American man, who took that concept and uh, invented this material that he called organite. Uh, Reich called the energy, the scalar energy, he called it organ. Uh, because he was a psychiatrist, he was actually a contemporary of uh, Sigmund Freud's, a friend of Freud's, uh, and he discovered this energy studying human sexuality, um, and discovered that this energy, he believed this energy that was causing sexual aberrations, he discovered was actually not just uh, involved with sexuality. So Carl Hans Wells took those concepts and created this material that he called organite, and now people are using it all across the world, just lay people making these devices based on Wells' work and other people's work uh, that can clear these chemtrail pollutants out of the sky. Um, and you can actually go on to uh, YouTube and see videos, uh, real-time videos of people doing this. Uh, if you search on chemtrail buster or cloud buster, uh, you can see videos of people doing this. And there are other people I've met who have uh, figured out ways of doing it with little small pyramids and combinations of crystals and organite and things like that. So there, lots of people are spinning off technologies just using simple stuff that you can get from Home Depot and eBay. You know, uh, so people can protect themselves in that way. And uh, also, uh, you know, one of the things I've been teaching for years uh, is um, cellular regeneration and detoxification and getting nutrients into the body to regenerate and heal cells. And so with the amount of pollutants that we have in our, in our environment, not even including radioactivity now and, and these uh, geoengineering pollutants, just the, the normal stuff in our environment is cause enough to need to detoxify the body on a regular basis. And so um, there are different foods and herbs and supplements for doing that that work extremely well. Um, and so that's a part of the process. And that's something that I teach is uh, you know, specifically like what kinds of foods you can use uh, to do that. Um, so uh, I, think, I think it's appropriate at this point to ask you, uh, Ken, our guest is Ken Lola, and I'm going to ask him to give his Highly, highly informative website again. Okay, my website is, is freshandalive.com, and my blog, which has the majority of, of informational type stuff, is beyondrawfood.com. Why is it necessary to go beyond raw food? Well, because uh, I started out, oh, probably 20 years ago, um, learning about. Uh, cellular regeneration and healing with living foods, and uh, there are a lot of people now who are interested in that and that are teaching it who believe that we can get everything from our foods to maintain our health, and uh, that is not true anymore in, in our environment, because number one, the nutrients are not in our foods. Even if you're buying organic these days, organic food is nothing like it should be, and you don't have to take my word for that. You can measure it in your own kitchen. Uh, you can buy a device called a Brix meter, B-R-I-X, uh, also known as a refractometer, and you can 
fast produce in your own kitchen and see what the BRICS reading is on them. And you can compare compare that to charts of uh, recommended values for various fruits and vegetables. And you can see in your own kitchen whether or not the food actually has the nutrients it should have. Um, so that's one problem. We don't have the nutrients. The food is being picked too early in order for it to be shipped great distances to us. Um, and then farmers, even organic farmers, uh, oftentimes don't know how to build uh, healthy soil and soil that particularly is high in these monotonic elements. They're so extremely regenerative. Um, so food is not what it should be. And, um, and even if it is, if you're breathing in or eating or drinking radioactive particles, you've got to get them out of the body and quick. And so um, food may be able to do that. I mean, certainly there are foods like uh, brown seaweed extract and uh, lots of herbs. Um, apple pectin is a really good one. Um, um, stragglers, um, parsley, um, cilantro. There's lots of herbs that will chelate, detox, even radioactive uh, elements out of the body. But there are some that work particularly well, and, and uh, one is zeolites. Uh, those, that's a mineral that is phenomenal for attaching to free radicals and radioactive elements and pulling them out of the body. Um, and then also protecting against, for example, the thyroid uptaking radioactive elements because it's a very electric organ and it wants to latch onto these isotopes. So what the typical <clears throat> medical approach to do is to Ken, are you with us? Ken, uh, I think we just lost our guest, Ken Rola. Uh, Richard, can you, Richard is our engineer, folks. Uh, Richard, can you call him back? I will give it a try, yes. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> Very interesting uh, discussion so far, Dr. Rena. And by the very way, as I've I've been uh, recording this to put on uh, on our YouTube channel, and I've we've been exploring Ken's website and uh, and that sort of thing. So uh, the people who see this uh, in the non-live version <laughs> will get some additional information. Hello. Sorry about that. There he is. Phone, phone died. I'm back. Um, so one of the one of the methods. Uh, well, I said the medical fashion. What they do is. Um, give you iodine that loads up the thyroid so that radioactive iodine won't uh, get into the thyroid, or at least not as badly, but a better approach is to use monoatomic iodine, which uh, doesn't um, have the negative side effects of um, elemental iodine or now, organic iodine. Now, let's talk, anybody who's been through um, high school chemistry would now be shaky and, and not familiar with the uh, uh, monoatomic element. Is now shaking their head saying, what? 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 Okay. What's, what's monoatomic? What? what are we talking about? So if you yeah. could back up here a little, that would be great. Okay. Okay, yeah. Actually, usually when I talk about these subjects, I start out explaining scalar energy and monoatomics because they're both closely related. What monoatomic elements are, it's been discovered. It's actually been known, they've been known about for thousands of years, and they've been written about in, in, in various cultures, but uh, they were rediscovered in the United States back in the 70s by a man named David Hudson. And uh, what they are are simply the platinum group elements on the periodic chart, gold, silver, mercury, and copper, um, maybe one or two others, that normally the, all of these elements exist as metals, and they have a structure where the atoms are bound to each other in some kind of three-dimensional grid pattern that's called a crystalline lattice. And so what's been discovered is that these elements can all exist as uh, individual atoms where the atoms are not connected to each other. And when they're in that state, they look like white ceramic powders. They're non-toxic. In fact, they're highly regenerative and healing. And they uh, are superconductors. And so... Mm. They're, they're found in soil, microbes eat rocks, and particularly these, those elements, and break them down into small particle sizes of just a few atoms bundled together, which are called angstrom minerals. And then they also create monoatomic minerals, and then plants uptake them, and uh, we, the plants, or the animals that we eat, eat them. And so we get these monoatomic elements into our bodies, and because they're 
superconductors. They have a lot of really, really weird physics, and they are really the interface between consciousness and the physical body, for one thing. Um, Bruce Lipton showed where uh, there's a field that dictates a lot of the functions in cells uh, through the cell membrane, and um, what is what picks up that uh, those signals from the brain or from the field from the brain and from the body uh, are these monatomic elements. They're they're really strange in that they um, they're not regular matter. They're kind of this meta matter where part of the, the mineral exists in three dimensional space time, but the majority of it exists in other dimensions of time and space simultaneously. So it kind of connects other dimensions of time and space to dimensional reality simultaneously, and therefore it's able to connect consciousness to physicality. And in that way, um, it uh, it allows this data energy to come in and regenerate cells. Um, so long story short, it's very highly regenerative uh, if you get this in your food. And so you can feed plants uh, these monatomic elements, or you can feed plants rock patterns that are high in these elements, and the plant uh, microbes will break them down and deliver them to the plant roots. Plants uptake them. And so you can grow nutrient-dense food that's very high in these monatomics, which is very regenerative and also can um, help pull out and transduce these radioactive elements in the body. Um, and so, so these enormous elements are, are very crucial in maintaining health, and almost nobody knows about them. There are lots of people growing nutrient-dense food or making nutrient-dense food-based supplements that see these effects, but they don't know what's really responsible. Uh, but if you are consciously aware of it, you can do things like feed plants certain rock powders and bacteria, and you will radically increase the monotonic elements, uh, also known as ORMES, uh, O-R-M-E-S, which is an acronym for Orderly Rearranged Monotonic Elements, which is just what uh, David Hudson called them. So you can feed things to plants to generate these and increase the health of your body and detoxify at the same time. You can also feed them to microbes. So for example, you can make fermented foods uh, or fermented beverages and you can throw all kinds of nutrients into it that are high in these monoatomic elements. You can put rock powders into it and you can make your own supplements very inexpensively. They're all food-based and not toxic. They're highly regenerative to the body and they're very detoxifying. Those are the kinds of things that I teach in my workshops. It's these simple, inexpensive things that people can do. You can also vortex water in magnetic fields and scalar fields, and if, um, if it will make these minerals, uh, it will make inorganic minerals break down into angstrom and monoatomic sized particles so that the water can be fully metabolized and the minerals can be fully metabolized. Um, so there are these, these very simple tried and true things that you can do that have been around for thousands of years um, to maintain your health even amidst all of this radioactivity and these heavy metals and things coming into our body. So if the radiation is increasing as it is, if the chemical uh, toxicity, extreme toxicity, is increasing as it is, how does a person know that they're getting enough of the counteractive energy of the counteractive um, elements, elements of the counteractive nutrients? Well, what I always do um, is uh, I always recommend, uh, and I don't, I don't do private consults anymore. Years, years ago when I used to do private consults, I would always tell people, go get testing. You, know, you can't just guess and shoot in the dark. You have to know exactly what your health status is uh, before you do anything. And so, um, so I always recommend getting testing, biological testing, to see what the exact status of your body is so that you know what's going on. And so what I like to use myself personally, there is a, a device called a QXCICO. That's QXCISCIO. Is a quantum biofeedback machine that can read the scalar energy signatures uh, on any level of granularity in the body, and it, it compares what it sees in your body with a database of known uh, elements or, or diseases or pathogens or metals or whatever. And so it can see 
what uh, what's going on in the body in a in fairly good detail. There are other devices like uh, Konstantin Karotkov, this uh, Russian physicist, developed a device called a GDB camera. There are other quantum devices like this that can look at what's going on in the body. There's good old-fashioned blood tests. Uh, I like to use live blood cell analysis, so also known as light field or dark field microscopy, uh, to get a clear picture of exactly what my health status is. And then, based on that, uh, I will use detoxification with food-based supplements and uh, certain minerals, things like zeolite, and then also use uh, uh, um, growing my own food. I will grow, like sprouting, you can grow really nutrient-dense food very inexpensively. Um, and, um, and then unfortunately, you know, nowadays we have to, if we're buying food from the store, we've got to start uh, cleaning it. Um, and that's not a real solution, but if, if you're still buying food, which most people are, uh, there is something called BioWash that uh, you can Google BioWash. It's very good for removing contaminants from plants. Uh, it can also um, be fed to plants as a plant food and uh, make them stronger and healthier. But the real solution right now uh, is to grow as much of your own food as possible. Uh, particularly if you're growing it outdoors, you're going to have to grow greenhouses. Um, I'm actually going to build a, a greenhouse this weekend. And uh, if you're particularly if you're doing sprouting, sprouting is a, a really wonderful way to get high levels of nutrients in a small package, uh, inexpensively, very inexpensively. And um, and even if let's say you're buying seeds for sprouting that are contaminated, you can decontaminate them through using these bacteria like effective microorganisms, which is a, a mixture that a, a Japanese professor, uh, agriculture professor named Tiro Wahiga developed. And uh, I sell those on my website. So you can you can spray those on your land and they will break down toxins and they will accelerate transmutation of radioactive elements. Uh, Tiro Wahiga has been proving that in experiments in Japan using his microbes to remediate radioactivity in soil and in crops. Um, so between bacteria and fungus and, and um, E. coli and these various things, you can you can put them, I wouldn't recommend spraying E. coli on your property, but but you can use these um, these bacteria uh, to put them on your property to break these toxins down into non-toxic elements. Um, and uh, but my my approach is doing that, but also uh, growing food in the greenhouse, sprouting a lot of our food. And we also have um, some hydroponic uh, growing devices called tower gardens that technically they call them aeroponic, but they use high formats fermented plant food that the plants can uptake very readily. Uh, more than I'm not a big fan of hydroponics. Uh, because the, the nutrient levels and the energetics in the plant are just not going to be as good as growing in soils. But the people that came up with the tower garden figured out how to make these high ormus plant foods that will feed the plant directly and energetically, chemically and, ener and energetically. And you can get really nutrient-dense food in a very small space. And For example, my wife and I have two of them. And we eat every day gigantic salad with the produce grown off of those uh, and a big variety of stuff. I think the the bottom line is that with a little bit of effort and a little bit of um, uh, dedication, there is an enormous amount that we can do for ourselves. There are a couple of uh, caveats that I want to um, to add here. Uh, the first is that I am not a fan of zeolite. I have suspected for a very long time that zeolite uh, as an aluminum uh, mineral, which does chelate metals, there's no question, and it's used in nuclear power plants and so on. Very, very interesting substance. But uh, I have suspected for a variety of reasons that the aluminum in zeolite actually dissolves and uh, enters the body, adding to the heavy metal burden. Uh, most people could prove me. It turns out now that we have laboratory confirmation that zeolites are great in industrial situations, but you really don't want to put them into your body because they add heavy metals to your body. Um, and that's, yeah. that's a thing that is very important. But the second thing is that um, the act of growing food I said six years ago, would become civil, an act of civil disobedience inside.
five years, and I was worried. The police are conducting raids in various uh, places in the United States just to make sure that you're not going past. In other words, they destroy, they destroy your food garden, your indoor food garden. Uh, people who are growing food uh, in their yard, which is not a good idea because of the radiation at this point. The people who are growing open-air gardens are being forced to plow them under and destroy them because of um, Agenda 21 zoning um, regulations. Uh, zoning is one of the ways that Agenda 21 is being brought in to destroy private property and uh, independent living in many, many ways. Um, and so it's not quite so simple to just grow your own food. You should, and it is an act of civil disobedience that everybody should engage in. Uh, in some places, it's not yet illegal. But it is becoming illegal and more and more complex, which makes it even more important to do, even if you didn't particularly want to garden. And then there's seed saving. If you want a world in which the genome does not belong exclusively to the biotech companies and governments of the world, then start growing and saving organic heirloom seeds today. Exactly, Dr. Rima. Uh, you're, you're correct about the zeolites, uh, but there are some exceptions. Um, this is something that I teach. Um, there is a brand of zeolite uh, that's monoatomic, where the aluminum has been removed through, uh, I believe, a fermentation process in magnetic fields and maybe stator fields uh, called umbiagold zeolite. But you don't even need to do that because there, there are other methods for pulling these metals out. But you can actually make your own monotonic zeolites simply by putting them into one of these fermented brews, like with Chiruahiga's effective microorganisms, and break them down and pull the aluminum out and make it non toxic. So there are always options. Um, but there are lots of other uh, chelators. You know, there's brown seaweed extract, there's apple pectin, there's uh, various herbs, there's chlorella, blue green algae, and wheatgrass juice, and spirulina, there's sodium alginate. There's lots and lots of solutions for, for detoxification. Um, and anybody, I mean, I've got uh, students and friends who live in high rises in Miami and places like that, and even they can grow a lot of their own food by sprouting inside their apartments or condos uh, because you don't need much sunlight to do it. And you can even do it if you're in a completely blacked out room, you can do it under grow lights. So, there are options for growing a lot of your own food and inexpensively. And if you use, for example, monatomic plant foods, uh, for example, there's a product called Sea Crop, S E A Crop. Uh, their website is S E A Crop, C R O P dot com. You can fold your seed sprouts with that and jack the nutrient levels way up. Uh, and that's a, an ocean water uh, monotonic concentrate. So there are lots of. I'm assuming that the ocean. I'm assuming that the ocean is not the Pacific, right? No, and actually, what they what they do is uh, take um, sea, sea minerals from the um, the Great Salt Lake. Uh, you can take sea minerals from the Great Salt Lake and do it. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, well that's very important. You know, people have to start asking, where does the seaweed come from? Where does the uh, the sea salt comes from, and if it comes from the Pacific, you don't want that in your body. You don't even want Precisely. it in the house. Precisely. I, I mean, I, I saw a map from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration showing that the entire Pacific, all the way down to Peru, had radioactivity in it. So yeah. I, I wouldn't take anything out of the ocean. I wouldn't even take anything out of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, but uh, you know, it depends on what you're what you want to use. There are, there are other options as well. There are supplements on the market uh, that that are not advertised for doing these things uh, because the inventors of them have been attacked. But uh, there, are, there are other supplements on the market that uh, do amazing things that uh, are being marketed for things like parasite cleanses and stuff like that. So there, there are solutions uh, when you start looking for them. There are indeed. Um, and, and Dr. Rima, we are reaching the last 10 minutes or so of the program. 
Well, let me ask you a question in the last 10 minutes. Uh, my guest is Ken Lola, and he's going to give us his website as soon as I finish asking my question. Uh, let's say that I don't live near your town in Florida. Let's say that because of one, um, one obligation or another, I can't get to your town in Florida. How can I uh, participate in and share your wisdom without actually living uh, coming to your seminars physically? Is that possible? Yes, uh, I'll, I'll be doing webinars and teleseminars uh, in 2014 so that people around the world can access my information. But also, uh, I go anywhere I'm at, so if people want me to come to their part of the world, uh, they should contact me and you know, we can set up a workshop somewhere. It's just a matter of you know, working out the economics of it so that I can afford to go, uh, which isn't typically very hard. So uh, I'll go anywhere people ask me to go. Uh, I like traveling. so. Uh, might not want to go to Fukushima, but uh, pretty much everywhere else. <laughs> but Santiago de Chile might be a... Oh, I'd love it. Actually, I'm considering moving to Chile. I've, I've been looking at moving offshore. Uh, in the southern hemisphere is where I want to go. Uh, but I know a lot of financial people are recommending Chile. Um, well, we should, so talk about that. we should talk about that off there. Uh, I recommend anybody who's thinking about moving to Chile do it. It's a remarkable and country. and pre-position some of your funds down there even before you move. Oh yeah, yes. oh yeah, yes. You want to talk a little bit about that real quickly, Ralph? Very quickly, you know the uh, Natural Solutions Foundation's um, Panama Corporation sponsors the Fund for Natural Solutions, which is an SEC filed private equity fund. Uh, that fund uh, uh, is is available. Uh, we are happy to speak to people about uh, helping them expatriate uh, some of their funds, uh, their uh, uh, IRAs or, uh, or uh, similar uh, funds, as well as personal funds and, and other, uh, other uh, available funds. Uh, you can contact me uh, through at ralph at fundfornaturalsolutions.org, and I'd be happy to, make, to discuss it with you. Uh, there are good possibilities that may be beneficial to most people. Excellent. Um, so you'll be doing webinars. I want you to come to Chile and do a, um, a series of lectures. I want people to know how to protect themselves, whether or not they're, they're in the Fukushima rain. This is fabulous information. Um, do you, what do you see if the best of all possible circumstances comes about? What do you see happening with Fukushima? Well, I, I'm hopeful that, uh, that I, I suspect that what is going to make the paradigm really shift is economics. And, uh, you know, uh, I think that the U.S. dollar is probably going to collapse very soon. It's been propped up by two ticks for so long, and now Russia and China are both moving away from using the dollar for doing trade. So if the dollar is no longer the reserve currency of the world, then it's going to collapse. Uh, and Americans are going to be hit hard in their wallets. So all of these folks who are living the standard American lifestyle and uh, kind of living denial of reality are going to come to a harsh um, wake up, and I think that it'll affect the global economy, and, and so I, I think that a lot of people are going to be forced to wake up very quickly, and, uh, and I suspect when that happens that, uh, that these the various technologies that can be used to clean this mess up will be allowed to come out then, because I think the existing control paradigm will fall apart. That's my hope. Um, uh, I don't see, I don't see, uh, Fukushima destroying the planet. There's there are too many smart people that know how to clean it up very quickly uh, for that to happen. Yet for two and a half but, or more years, there's been no real effort made. There's just been cover up and uh, and you know butt covering. Yeah, but I, I know I hear you know, I hear these stories about uh, the BRICS alliance of countries that are fed up with the. United States G8 countries and manipulating the rest of the world. And so I don't know how it's going to go down, but I, I 
suspect that these people with the money and the power that are manipulating things are going to lose their money and power. And the moment they lose their money, it's over. They're not going to be able to control anything. And then I think there will be a massive cascade of these solutions coming out just like crazy. Because, I mean, I know personally, I know lots of people who have solutions. I was just speaking at a conference. Uh, and there we go. Thank you, Ken. We're rolling, it seems to me, to the end of the program. Doctor.